So today on The Update, we're talking to Lewis Pugh. So Lewis, tell us a bit about yourself. Thank you so much. Yeah, so my, my name is Lewis Pugh. I'm an environmental campaigner um, and also a long distance swimmer. And so what I do is I, I swim in some of the most uh, uh, endangered parts of the mm -hmm. world's oceans to try and campaign for their protection. So what inspired your passion for the environment and the ocean to begin with? I was very lucky. As a young boy, my parents used to take me to lots of national parks so every single holiday. And I grew up in South Africa, and so mm. I used to go to Shishlui, Umfalozi, Kruger, these type of national parks. And I grew to really love the environment. When I was 17, I moved to Cape Town. And I, the school I was at, uh, on the, in the horizon, you could see Robben Island. And then when I was 17, I decided uh, I wanted to swim to this island. And that started a, a career of swimming. And then much later on in life, those, sort of, those two interests about wanting to protect the, the environment and wanting to swim sort of uh, merged together. Okay, so how do you go about mentally preparing yourself before a long swim? Yeah, it's not easy, especially, I mean, the world is divided between pioneers and followers. So you're either a pioneer or you're a follower. And so all the swims which I do are the first. So back in 2007, I did the first swim across the North Pole, and then in 2010, I did a swim even on Mount Everest in a glacial lake. And when you're standing there on the edge of the lake, on the edge of the ice, and you're looking into the water, and you realize no human swam here before, it's, it's a very frightening mm -hmm. place. It's much easier to go second. And so you've got to get your mind in a place where there's complete certainty about what you're going to do. And so obviously your preparation is, in order to get into that state of mind, yeah. Your preparation has got to be really good. So I train a lot in very, very cold water, and uh, I do a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of exercises. But it's at final moments before you're getting into the water, you've got to make sure that you're not diving in with two thoughts. And this so often happens. You know, people have this fallback position. So I try to make sure that I'm focused entirely on just swimming the distance and not thinking thoughts of victory and defeat, or if things go wrong, you, you've got to get all those thoughts out of your mind and be completely certain. And that involves making a decision. You, you've got to have a made up mind. Do you think your approach to these swims has changed as you've done more and more across the world? Well, I mean, during these swims, I, I, I've seen the oceans really change. So, you know, I've done swims up in the Arctic where I've seen massive, you know, sea ice melt and glacial melt. I've been doing swims in in the Indian Ocean where I've seen coral, coral reefs bleach because of climate change. I've done swims in Africa where you see they've been totally overfished. So I've changed in terms of, the, of my world outlook, you know. Now there's a sense of real urgency mm -hmm. to do these swims and as many as I can in lots of areas of the world to try and highlight what's happening to the oceans. Have I changed as a person? I'm not sure, but I was, very, I was a very focused and quite a determined young mm -hmm. boy. I think probably I can become a little bit more determined as I get older because these swims seem to be getting harder and harder. So which would you say is the most beautiful place you've been or the most mm. striking place? The in most terms beautiful of? place. In, you know, when you, when you do swims in, so the majority of the places I do the swims are in the Arctic and the Antarctic where the mm -hmm. water's below zero. Yeah. So, so when I did the swim across the North Pole, the water was minus 1.7. I mean, when you dive into that water, it is unbelievably cold. It's just, you can't even describe how cold it is. Mm -hmm. So when people ask me, where's the most beautiful place? When you've been swimming there, all you dream about is the Indian Ocean and mm -hmm. warm <laughs> tropical islands and golden beaches. And so for me, I, I did a, a long swim once across the Maldives and underneath me, all these tropical fish and coral reefs. And so, so that's probably for me the most special place. I also do a lot of swims in Norway where the water is fairly cold but it's not extreme cold and you can imagine swimming down a long fjord and you've got these um, f uh, you know mountain streams yeah. coming down into the fjord and little villages and uh, Sounds amazing. Sw swimming there <laughs> is very special. Mm, so you talked about a lot in the past about the need for like more and more marine parks. Yes. Why would you say that marine parks are more common than other parks like on land like Yellowstone and parks like that? The issue with marine protected areas is this, and that is you imagine a world without these big national parks mm -hmm. on land like Serengeti, Yellowstone, Kruger. Our world would be very different. We wouldn't have rhinos and elephants and 
and, and bison and all these other magnificent creatures. And it was about 100 years ago when people started creating these national parks. They forgot about doing it in the oceans and now less than 2% of our oceans are protected. Uh, what makes oceans very, very difficult is that there are parts of the oceans which are not owned by anybody. So let's just say the United Kingdom, uh, so you're from Great Britain, for 200 nautical miles off the coast of Britain, that is Britain's waters where, mm -hmm. where they're entitled to protect them. When you go beyond 200 nautical miles, you're into the high seas. And there is a very, very different situation. There in, you have to get a lot of countries to agree to protect those areas. And there are a lot of people who want to go in there and still fish. So it's very, very difficult to police. So, you know, if you're in British waters, the Royal Navy can come out and can protect the area quite easily. If you're, mm -hmm. you know, a thousand kilometers out at sea, much more challenging to police that type of marine protected area. And especially if you have a marine protected area down in Antarctica, where you're 11 days sailing yeah. from the nearest harbor. Yeah. So like in terms of the future, do you think like COP21 and other conferences like that will help people come more aware about the need for marine protection? and? I mean, COP deals with so many different yeah. areas. It's dealing with everything, all the different terrains in the world, from forests to, you know, to oceans, to polar regions, you, you name it. The COP negotiations are, are, are very, very important. I mean, you've got all these countries coming together, trying to achieve one thing, and that is trying to ensure the sustainability of this planet and trying to ensure that we cut carbon emissions so that we can yeah. protect this planet. It's crucial negotiations but very challenging because you've got so many countries, all with different interests, all with different needs, different mm -hmm. desires, different levels of development, all trying to get to one common place. It's challenging in, 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 a, in, a, in what is quite a divided world at the moment. Yeah, so if you could think of one thing that you want to come out of COP21, yeah. one major impact, what would you, what would you think? COP21, um, I'm not sure many people realise it, but the 21 means that we've been negotiating for 21 years. Really? Yeah. Wow. So that's for longer than your life. If I have one desire, it's that this year, this year we get it right. Yeah. Yeah. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to future generations. There's something fundamentally wrong about us living our lives in the current way. For me, I see it as an issue of justice. Not only justice between generations, so the current generation, we have to look after future generations. Yeah. We can't leave a world which is unsustainable. So you need to have intergenerational justice. But also, you, know, you find that developed countries use up so much more resources than developing countries. So we need to have justice between nations. But the last form of justice, which is, which is not talked about a lot, and that's justice between species. It seems to me to be something very, very wrong that we live our lives in such a way that we're pushing animals to the edge of extinction. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the WWF produced a report recently where they said that in the last 50, 40 years, we've lost 52% of the world's wildlife. That's a I, lot. Mean, I mean, just think about, you know, you can run over these statistics, but just think, slow down, just think about it. In the last 40 years, and you know, when you're young, 40 years seems like a long time. I can tell you 40 years is nothing, right? In the last 40 years, we've lost over half the world's wildlife. Oh, that's, yeah. that's a lot. And we need to fight for it. We need to fight to protect these places. So what would you say um, young people can do now mm. in order to help save the species, help for a sustainable future? Easy. Most times in life, the, the way things happen is the adults tell the children what to do. This is a case where it's much better that children tell the adults what to do, really. Yeah. And, and that is because you actually have the power. You only realize that when you're my age. But if all the children mobilise and they're telling their parents and they're telling the world leaders what they want, world leaders respond. So a poll in the United States recently found that um, one in five Americans don't think climate change is happening. Mm. What would you say to these climate deniers or people who don't yeah. fully believe that we need to act to save the planet? Yeah, it's a very worrying situation. Yeah, It's very worrying. And if you look back at the history of all the great movements, so if you go back to trying to abolish slavery, um, uh, trying to get women to have the vote, uh, ending of apartheid, all these type of things, there's always going to be some group who are going to lose. Some group who don't want it. And obviously in this case, uh, uh, there are interest groups who don't want change with the current system. In the main, these are the big energy companies 
who are drilling the oil and gas out of the out, out of the out of the earth and out of the sea in order to try you know get maximum profit yeah. but in doing it they're condemning all of us and the whole animal kingdom mm -hmm. to a very very bleak future yeah you know so that's the one side of thing but also you find that the media often portray it as a debate mm -hmm. like we're not sure that climate change is actually happening okay that's also incredibly unethical because you you speak to any of the any of the of the respectable climate scientists in the world and they will tell you that what we're seeing now has been caused in the main by us humans what can we do about it truth will always prevail okay eventually but there's a sense of urgency that we need to get the situation sorted yeah. out very very quickly I don't know what to do other than just to keep campaigning and keep lobbying and keep keep at it yeah, yeah. you know um, the movement to bring South Africa as you'll hear from my accent I, I grew up in South Africa but the movement to to transform South Africa from apartheid to a multi uh, multi-party democracy Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in jail mm -hmm. sometimes change really takes a long time but yeah. we in this case we can't afford that luxury of time thank you for speaking us today it was really interesting uh, it's been a privilege to be here thank you so much